Nicole is on the Florida Panhandle, or just about on the Florida Panhandle, and heading into southern Georgia, and then up the west side of the Appalachians. And that's going to mean for some rain, some wind, some thunderstorms, and maybe even some severe weather as uh, this uh, system uh, impacts the eastern part of the U.S., already is in parts of the southeast, and of course uh, in Florida and in the Panhandle. The snows in the northern plains winding down, bringing down some colder air. That gets into the east on Sunday, and we'll take a look at all of that, plus the long range. It's always fun. Tonight on the Joe and Joe Weather Show, brought to you by our friends at Omni True Value Hardware at 1226 North Wellwood Avenue in West Babylon, New York, which is in southwest Suffolk County on Long Island, serving the entire New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, tri-state area. Everything you need to make sure you can get through adverse weather, lose power, you need batteries, flashlights, you need a new generator. Maybe you need a sump pump if there's a flood. And, of course, if you want to make your yard look great, there's mulch and topsoil, although that season is just about run out. And Long Island's largest rock salt source. They are getting ready for winter at Omni. 631-756-1125. The best prices anywhere in town. And the website is... OmniTrueValue.com. Calm, 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 calm. Yes, calm, it calm. is. And Joe. Oh is wait, so look at this! Pretty. I'm so happy, Joe, because I just noticed. I forgot to. So usually, this is just technical stuff. I when you see me, I'm on a separate video source. Okay, that one. So you got two of me here. Okay. Right. But, and I've been moving you and getting rid of me on this because I. Uh, it, for some reason, it would just uh, we couldn't broadcast properly that way. Uh, however, uh, somebody got his broadband today. Yay! Yay! So, <laughs> okay, I see you ran the you, you ran the free commercial. So hold on a second. I'm going to get rid of me, move you, and then get me back up here. There we go. So there we are. Okay, so we have yes. a little we have a little audio feedback, which is all well, that's a Zoom issue. So anyway, uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Joe and Joe Weather Show. And the attention is focused on uh, what eventually will be left of Nicole, uh, moved into Florida today, uh, came in as a minimal hurricane. Uh, I, I was talking with a few people, Joe. The tidal flooding uh, was pretty extensive on the Florida coast. A lot of places that had their beaches wiped out basically by uh, on the East Coast that had their beaches wiped out to an extent by Ian because when it came out on the east side of Florida, um, the the wind from the north, all the coastal flooding came down the intercoastal waterways and, 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 and down the coast, and uh, that messed up all the beaches. Uh, well, this Nicole coming in from the east uh, and that tight pressure gradient uh, made it worse this time around. So a lot of places are reporting that, that there's no beach left. And you know what's odd? Uh, if, uh, the two hurricanes that made landfall in the I'd be right, two hurricanes that made landfall in the United States states this season, both in Florida, one came in from the west, west. and crossed. <laughs> And yeah. the other one came in from the east and, and crossed, virtually taking almost the same path. <laughs> I mean, t you know, talk about, talk about, I said yesterday, this was a strange hurricane season. I, I think that really tops it off that you had Ian coming in from one direction. Then you have Nicole that came in from the other direction. And they the people that were in that track line in the middle got clobbered with all that rain from Ian. This one at least was not quite as bad, but still, that's just really odd that it happened that way. Pretty odd indeed. Very, very interesting. And uh, now we are going to be set for um, what we're going to be getting from Nicole. And it looks like, Joe, a little of everything. Showery rains, maybe some spurts of heavy rainfall, and yes, some convection as well. I would not rule out the possibility late tomorrow or tomorrow evening of some rumbles of thunder, some lightning. And then there may actually be a little bit of a break in the overnight hours. And then the last surge, the last kick, if you will, as the front associated with 
all of this, the front that is going to that Nicole latches onto, that front will pass on through first thing in the morning on Saturday with maybe another round of showers and maybe some grumbles of thunder. But then after that, I want to tell you something. I, I you know, I looking at this by you know late morning, you know, 10, 11 o'clock, maybe noontime on Saturday, on through the rest of the day, Saturday, the sun comes out. We have a gusty breeze out of the northwest, but still a lot of low-level mild air still in place. And with that sunshine, my goodness, I could I temperatures on Saturday, I I think in the Hudson Valley now could reach up to 69, 70, 72, maybe even dare I say 74 degrees. It is not, I think, out of the question that we could see another day of a record. In fact, tomorrow, I'm jumping, getting ahead of myself. We, even with the cloud cover and even with the developing showers by late morning or midday tomorrow and showers tomorrow afternoon and evening, even with that, south southwesterly or south actually south southeasterly winds, we could see temperatures here in the Hudson Valley tomorrow well up in the 60s to near 70 degrees. So potentially two more record-breaking or record-setting days temperature-wise coming up, coming on the heels of three record setting days that we had last Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And yes, for those of you who've looked at your weather maps, uh, looked on the uh, internet at the GFS model and the European model and all the other models, yes, I could see that there could even be a few wet snowflakes in the air come Tuesday night or early Wednesday as colder air, really much colder air, settles into the region beginning Sunday on into the early part of next week. Crazy weather, Joe. You'll be happy to know, by the way, that the Canadian model of all models supports your contention. About what, snow? About, about maybe being cold enough for some some, some uh, wet snow in the mix when precip, uh, when precip arrives. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm not calling for a, a significant snowfall or accumulations or whatever, but... The first sighting of some wet flakes in the air, particularly in the Hudson Valley, if you live, I'd say, north of the 84 corridor um, on on Tuesday night or early Wednesday. By the way, we were talking last night when we were doing Briller Jeopardy, we were talking about that uh, uh, day, the coldest uh, November, uh, lowest uh, temperature in the month of November was on the 30th of November in 1875 when it got down to five above zero. And he found... Not for New York City, but he fi- found a monthly climate sum- summary for Trenton, New Jersey, and it's you know each day it's got the high and the low and and the precip. Uh, what, what was striking to me was how cold it was uh, in well in Trenton. So you got to figure it's not going to be that much different than how it was in New York, and it's probably somewhat representative of what was happening. Uh, in in uh, much of eastern Pennsylvania to southern New England, but uh, the first uh, the the high temperatures for the first ten days of the month one two three four five six seven of those days Joe it didn't get above forty six for a daytime high okay. Wow. And on the other four <clears throat> the highs were fifty fifty two six fifty three and fifty one. Uh, then on the uh, 12th and 13th, it was 62 and 64. And after that, you just kind of went down 50s. On the 17th, uh, the high the high was 42. On the, 18th, on the 18th, the high was 44. The low on the morning of the 18th was 29. Uh, the 19th was 52. And then it was mostly 40s to around 50. Up until the, on the 28th, when the high was 45, the low was 32. Uh, on the on the 29th, the high was 46 and the low was 30. On the 30th, the high, Joe, the high was 20 and the low was nine. Jeez. So I mean, just uh, and by the way, the snow for that month, okay, for the whole month. On the 1st of November, there was a trace of snow recorded, and that was it for the whole month. The, to- the total precip for that month was 6.08. The average high was 47.7, and the average low was 35.7. So that was a very cold month of November, for sure. 
And meanwhile, I made the notation on my Facebook page in my forecast for the Hudson Valley tomorrow night. I said, tomorrow night here in the Hudson Valley, and tomorrow is what, the 11th day of November, it's going to feel more like a night in July or August with the temperature probably averaging within a degree or two of 65. That is going to be the overnight low temperature, I think, tomorrow night here in the Hudson Valley. And take note, the normal high temperature for this time of the year in the Hudson Valley is 52. So temperatures tomorrow night for a low will be about a dozen or more degrees higher than what the normal high temperature would be. And again, we're sitting on the potential of record-setting temperatures at White Plains tomorrow and once again on Saturday as well. And then the bottom falls out of the thermometer and it gets cold. We get back to normal. We get back to where we should be on Sunday. And then on Monday and Tuesday, temps drop to unseasonable levels into the upper and middle 40s for high temperatures. So we're going up and down. It's, and it's, it's, it's been crazy this month of November. I think, I'm not sure what it is right at this moment, but I think at Central Park, it was something like 11 or 12 degrees above normal. And we'll, 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 we'll raise that even a little more with these spells of warm weather or mild weather tomorrow and Saturday. And then we'll start uh, chipping away and knocking that incredibly high average temperature down we get to Sunday and the first half of next week. Yeah, not have, having all these tropical systems in, 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 that we've had. I mean, that certainly has had an, had an impact on the weather pattern in the eastern part of the United States. You've got a, a hurricane that came into Florida now and it's turning northward. All uh, all it does is, you know, that's all thanks to a reinforced ridge uh, in the east, uh, and um, you now that's just the way it happens. If you get tropical activity. Uh, you're going to have some. Uh, you're going to have some impact on the broad scale pattern. Because when you look at the long range, you don't really see it. Uh, it's only until you get to maybe in the med- medium range you start to see hints of well. Now there looks like there's going to be a tropical system. That's probably going to mean a stronger ridge in the eastern part of the United States. We certainly saw that uh, with what went on over the last couple of weeks with that record high stretch and Hurricane Martin that was out offshore. And now, of course, we've got uh, with Nicole that is uh, at least uh, making its made its or it's about to make or may have already made its final uh, move inland. I've got the uh, Tallahassee radar, Joe, and uh, it looks like uh, it looks to me, if I had to guess, because uh, the center's has become a little bit difficult to find. It's probably in that open area where there's no precip going on the, the low center has actually been straddling the florida panhandle i'm sorry the uh the, the big bend of florida and uh it looks to me like it's probably uh inland now not not very far from tallahassee you can see where the bands of rain are are occurring back through alabama southern georgia uh over the western part of the florida panhandle as it continues to move uh, on to the north northwest and uh, on the satellite uh it uh you could start to see also, Joe, on the satellite that it's be, it, it's really beginning to make that transition into something post-tropical. It, 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 the clouds have all spread out. You've got high clouds already uh, up into Pennsylvania, uh, into uh, Ohio. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not. This never really got to be a very wrapped up, tight little tight system. Uh, so now that it's moved, it moved up into the northern, you know, such a move into the uh, higher latitudes uh, and uh, begins to feel the effects of the cold front that you could see blowing up thunderstorms in eastern Kansas and in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, the system is beginning to spread out and probably starting to make a slow transition into a non-tropical low that's going to move up the uh, west side of the Appalachians. And they uh, they pretty much stop uh tracking the national hurricane center does uh by uh by saturday or uh friday into saturday uh assuming that it makes the transition the full transition over as it will to an extra tropical system and then it'll just be a matter of uh, handing it off to uh the regular forecasters of the weather prediction center as to where the wave of low pressure the remnant low uh goes but it likely will go west of the new york city area and as i mentioned yesterday because it moves to our west, we remain for a while in that rather warm wedge, uh, which is going to allow for 
abnormally mild temperatures. It's going to we're going to wait until the upper low, the upper level uh, system uh, crosses over us on Saturday night. That will turn the upper level winds to a more west or west northwest direction and begin to drive in. Actually, won't even drive in. It'll be it'll be uh, the beginnings will be filtering in that chillier, colder air, which will be in place. It will be noticeably chillier here in the Northeast in our neck of the woods, the New York Tri-State area on Sunday, whereas it may be in the low 70s, for goodness sake, Saturday afternoon. Sunday, it'll be a good 20 degrees colder, but we don't stop there. It will be only in the 40s for a high on Monday and Tuesday. So that gradual transition back to colder weather, but for the moment at least, we're gonna be in that, uh, that flow of unseasonable warmth once again, uh, it was pretty mild out there today. It will be mild, relatively speaking, for a night in uh, November tonight, even warmer tomorrow, an incredibly warm night for November tomorrow night, again, more like July and August. And then as we get into uh, the weekend, a uh, dichotomy, warm on Saturday, much colder weather settling in for Sunday. It's going to pre- feel pretty tropical tomorrow. It's almost as if we're getting a warm front coming up and moving through and <clears throat> bringing in the tri- high, much higher dew points and then the cold front swipping eastward as the low goes by. I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit. I wanted to just jump to tomorrow's uh, Storm Prediction Center uh, forecast outlook. They've moved the marginal risk up. The northern edge of the marginal risk up is now to New York City uh, and uh, into the northeast part of Pennsylvania, where the uh, three borders, the three states border. And uh, the marginal risk uh, extends down into Maryland and Delaware. We've got a slight risk of severe weather a little bit further south from there. From it's much of southeast Virginia, western and central North Carolina, and parts of uh, the eastern part of South Carolina. And by the way, that comes with a a rather elevated risk for tornadoes with this tropical air and, and the cold front coming. Plus, you've got this, the, 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 whenever these tropical systems, whenever these tropical systems come inland and they become remnant lows or they become post tropical lows, uh, they almost always carry a little bit of the tropical characteristics in there somewhere. Okay. Uh, there's all, and, and, and you're going to see it probably played out with the convective activity, uh, and, and I and I and I think this is why SPC is doing what it's doing with uh, with with the elevated tornado risk tomorrow uh, in, uh, in in the Mid Atlantic states. Uh, I think I think we could very well see a few spin-ups, uh, and I wouldn't shock me at all if uh, SPC winds up pushing that marginal risk even a little bit further north into the lower Hudson Valley and into Connecticut and Long Island uh, before this is all said and done. Yeah, this is this is to me somewhat reminiscent of, uh, you may remember this, Joe Halloween. We were both working at the time at uh, Fios One uh, News. Uh, Halloween in the year 2018, in that year, there were unseasonable uh, warm temperatures and also uh, I forget exactly the uh, weather configuration, the map configuration, but there was a threat of uh, locally severe weather, showers, thunderstorms, and yes, even tornadic activity. And uh, this is coming uh, a couple of weeks later in the calendar, this pattern, but it's, it's again, it, uh, it's reminiscent of what we saw, again, around Halloween four years ago. And uh, again, even this late in the season, we could see it happen. And this one, again, as you said, being driven by a full-fledged tropical system, that of course being uh, uh, Nicole, uh, working its way through northern Florida now and eventually to ripple northward in our direction during tomorrow and tomorrow night. Uh, By the way, I just pushed it back to tonight in terms of the severe weather risk tonight, which is in, uh, in, in in North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, the eastern half of South Carolina, southeast Georgia, with a little flank of marginal risk there. And here, too, we see a area of 2 to 5% tornado risk uh, for uh, the overnight. I noticed on the radar a few uh, red tornado boxes have popped up here and there, just pop up on the latest radar. I'm just going to give it a quick refresh. Uh, not, there was, there were some, I think I saw one earlier 
down near the Florida Panhandle. Nothing there now. Uh, there's one special marine warning that's uh, offshore Georgia. Uh, but you can see the rain is already pushed into North Carolina. Uh, I actually had some rain, which was shocking to me because I've seen so little of it in the last uh, two and a half months. Uh, but the signature on the radar sh still shows you how it looks like a tropical system. But you're starting to see the, the, the rain area. The rain shield is gradually expanding northward and northwestward. And we're going to continue to see this expansion as the weather front approaches. And meanwhile, as far as the weather front is concerned, uh, we have some downpours and some scattered thunderstorms from the upper peninsula of Michigan uh, down through Wisconsin, eastern Iowa. Uh, looks like they are uh, just uh, passing through Kansas City. Uh, and uh, into southeast Kansas and into eastern Oklahoma. So that's your front coming east. Uh, and uh, we talked yesterday about how uh, it's really setting up the alleyway. I mean, you kind of could look at the radar if you didn't really have a whole lot of uh, experience with regards to forecasting. You could look at this and say, okay, we got a front coming east. We got this tropical system. You know, if, if you wanted to take a guess where it was going to go, uh, you know, the front's coming eastward. And, uh, well, uh, that leaves uh, the path of least resistance is to go uh, north and northeast. And whenever storms come on the west side of the Appalachians, when these tropical systems go by the on the west side of the Appalachians, we, we don't get into some of what's left of that core of precip. We're going to get into these arms, if you want to describe it, uh, as they come up tomorrow. And as you said, there'll be a we'll get those. There'll be a break, and then as the low goes by, then you'll just get the cold front to come through, and that's what's going to set off some. Th I, I think your better chance of thunderstorms may come tomorrow night uh, when that uh, when that front passes. Yeah, I think actually in the wee hours of uh, Saturday morning, uh, the the actual remnant center of Nicole will probably pass just north and northwest of the tri-state area. And it will drag, again, a frontal line through here, and that will be the uh, genesis, as you just mentioned, Joe, for the possibility for another round of precipitation, showery rains, and also, again, some rumbles of thunder, a bit of convective, activ convective activity, again, due to uh, the remnant effects of Nicole. And then N Nicole, the remnant uh, center, is going to fly away to the north and east up toward uh, uh, eastern uh, Massachusetts and uh, the uh, Gulf of Maine by later in the day on Saturday. Uh, and actually, the front will have passed on by, but the true, really cold air is going to hold and wait until probably sometime later on Sunday. Uh, there, there's like an upper level trough that's going to be draped across uh, western and central New York State on Sunday. And when that comes through, uh, we'll see the, uh, I mean, we're going to see a big drop in temperature between. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, but the uh, the really big drop is going to come su Sunday into Monday when we see again those temperatures fall from well near 70 on Saturday, low and mid 50s on Sunday, and quite possibly staying in the 40s for a high on Monday when that second shot of cold air sweeps on in. And here's the uh, what Joe was talking about. So this is what uh, this this is what represents the coal. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, sitting uh, just northeast of me uh, in northeast Georgia. This is the trough that uh, is is uh, moving it along and the upper high that's offshore. So we've got this strong southerly flow or strengthening southerly flow along the east coast. And uh, up it goes. Uh, now, the feature that represents Nicole, uh, it, it, uh, it's hard to find, but it's there. There's this kink. Right in there, you see how the, the lines here, the height lines just kind of kink a little bit. This is what's left of the, that's the short wave with the coal. This is early Saturday morning at 1 a.m. The main trough is still back uh, west of the Mississippi at that point. And then uh, if we kick it along to the northeast by morning, uh, the uh, kink that I described that represents what's left of the coal and the low that, that, that the, the non-tropical low that it will become, uh, is now passing through, uh, now passing through and moving into New England. That upper trough to the west, swinging east, and uh, as you said, it doesn't. That upper trough doesn't really get through here uh, until sometime on Sunday, and it's with that that we get the cold air. So that's the reason right. why, right? That and that explains the delay. 
and the cold air stays because you see where our flow is coming from. There's actually another uh, disturbance moving into the Dakotas in the upper atmosphere uh, by uh, Sunday afternoon. And while the first trough is going to pull out, the second one is going to replace it, and that's going to keep things cold uh, probably uh, for this whole upcoming week for the most part. Yeah, it's funny because on Sunday, people are going to be walking around saying, oh, my God, it's freezing out here because, of course, they got accustomed to the upper 60s and perhaps even the 70s on Saturday, the 60s tomorrow, uh, even the 60s we had today. And yet on Sunday, the temperatures will be pretty well on target, exactly where they should be at this time of the year. But it, you get spoiled. You feel so much colder, about 20 degrees colder on Sunday compared to Saturday. And then after that, it gets into the unseasonably cold uh, uh, range on Monday and Tuesday with those temperatures only in the 40s. So that's truly the cold air. But again, by dropping back to where it should be at this time of the year on Sunday, for many, it's going to feel downright frigid, uh, a cold slap in the face. But the real cold, again, as you just mentioned, Joe, waiting for that second upper level system to move on through. And that waits until Monday and Tuesday. I uh, got the probability for you snow lovers. This is what's left of uh, what's been going on in the West. The probability of at least two uh, in northern Minnesota uh, over parts of the upper peninsula of Michigan and also the, the parts of the northern air, northwest part of the lower peninsula of Michigan. Now, some of that that you're seeing, at least around the Great Lakes, comes after the cold front comes by and the upper trough comes in and they get some lake effect stuff going on. And there's actually a little patch of uh, 40% probability in northwest PA, southwest New York. Very, very small area there. Uh, but that pretty much covers it uh, for uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, for the next uh, three days. If you look out west, there's a small area being indicated uh, in parts of Oregon and, 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 and in California, but really nothing to write home about. In the meantime, uh, we can check WPC's uh, rainfall forecast. Just want to show what they're doing. With respect to Tropical Storm Nicole, uh, the light green is one to two inches. They actually now have taken much of the air, New York area and Philadelphia area, Washington, D.C., Baltimore area, and the Boston area out of, out of that one to two inch zone. I don't know. I, I, I think, it, there's, it, I think there is, there's enough convective activity here with this that um, we may still wind up with it. I think we could still wind up with an inch, maybe an inch and a half. I'm going to stick with that idea. Uh, understanding that I might be overdoing it here, but the two to four inch rains in uh, Western Ohio, Northwest PA, again, this is a function of, of the fact that this thing is taking a track so far to the left. I mean, it's going up the, now, at least yesterday with the models were actually taking it up the Appalachians, maybe slightly on the East side of the Appalachians, slightly. It, it, this has gone from originally trying to see a low that was going to go offshore uh, look how, you know, the error here in the longer range is pretty large. It, it's it's uh, several hundred miles further west than what was being advertised by the models just a few days ago. Right. Which only goes to show that sometimes, even with tropical systems, you can't go more than two or three days out in advance to try to project what they're going to do. Because, as you just pointed out, this was supposed to be a strictly a coastal system, and now it is... Uh, well, it's moved significantly well west or inland as opposed to what we were thinking just two or three days ago. By the way, I'm still scratching my head as to why NASA left their moon rocket, the Artemis 1, out on the launch pad. For goodness sake, uh, getting a report uh, that the winds gusted up to 100 miles per hour. Now, the criteria uh, is 85. But usually when they expect temperatures, uh, not temperatures, but winds to go above 85 uh, knots, 85 uh, knots, that the uh, the uh, rocket should be brought inside. And yet, here we had winds that were gusting past 100 miles per hour, and they still let... Now, I'm hoping that no damage was done to that rocket, because they're supposedly going to launch that thing uh, late Sunday night or just after midnight, early Monday morning. But if anything does go wrong, or if there are any delays, technical delays, you have to figure that they may have been induced by leaving... Uh, a moon rocket 300 and some odd feet high with 8 million pounds of thrust, uh, leaving it out in the midst of a Category 1 hurricane yesterday and last night. 
Well, at least it got a good wash. Yes, <laughs> indeed, indeed. All right, here's uh, the watches and warnings map up tonight around the country. Uh, we'll go from west to east, uh, so our West Coast fans uh, won't uh, will be happy. We're giving you some attention there. We've got some winter weather. No, not, no, are those winter weather advisories or those might be frost and freeze. Those look like frost and freeze warnings in parts of central, the interior part of central and northern California. And uh, we've got a couple of leftover winter weather advisories in northwestern Montana. Winter storm warnings continue across North Dakota and northwest Minnesota. We've got uh, much of eastern North Dakota and northwestern Minnesota under uh, under lizard warnings uh, at the moment. I know I left out the B. It's blizzard warnings. Meanwhile, yeah. Joe, meanwhile, Joe, I have a wind advisory here. We have wind advisories up for the state of Georgia. I'm curious as to what they're forecasting in terms of specific wind. So we'll go to the National Weather Service office in Peachtree City, Georgia, and uh, take a look at uh, what they are saying specifically uh, with regard to this um, wind advisory. And uh, right now, by the way, at the Blairsville International Airport, it's 64 degrees with an east wind at 8 miles an hour. And I said we, we had rain a couple hours ago it's just been pretty just cloudy ever since and let's see the wind advisory uh is for now the criteria here is different with wind advisories so joe they're going for northeast winds <coughs> of 10 to 20 miles per hour with gusts to 40. so it, they're covering it for the gusts of 40 miles an hour uh to uh, uh, uh for the wind advisory uh, and uh, noting that the impacts would be gusty winds could blow around unsecured objects, tree limbs could be blown down, and a few power outages may result. I'll just emphasize the fact that I hope, I hope all my hickory nuts from the hickory trees out here are down because some of them are the size of of um, tennis balls. Ouch. And these trees, but Joe, these trees are very, very high. These are old trees. They're very, very high. So when the hickory nuts that are near the top of the tree break off and come down and hit the roof, you hear it. I mean, you really hear it, okay? Yeah. It's loud. It's very, wow. very loud. So, um, but yeah, we've got uh, we've got the wind advisories up here, and uh, hopefully we'll get an inch or so of rain because it's been just absolutely ridiculously dry. Uh, only rain, I think this is maybe the sixth time since the early part of September that we've had any rain at all. And uh, I, I would I would bet that the rainfall has been altogether under a quarter of an inch or maybe even under a tenth of an inch when you add it all together. We do have tornado watches up right now in parts of eastern South Carolina and, and in southwestern North Carolina, uh, also in southeast Georgia. You see the red is the tropical storm warning, the brownish area is the wind advisory. We also have flash flood uh, watch, uh, watches up for western North Carolina uh, and into a small portion of southwestern Virginia. Uh, in, even though the heaviest rain is going to uh, be just to the le uh, to areas north and west of there, uh, th there is going to be, a, uh, because of the mountains themselves and the wind coming in from the east, there's going to be some lift. And uh, as a result, I think in some of those mountain areas could wind up with the uh, WPC's got four to six inches of rain being indicated uh, in some of the mountains uh, in uh, <clears throat> in western North Carolina. And you can see on their map that they got this little stripe here of uh, two and a half to five inches uh, from uh, western North Carolina. Uh, and even into uh, parts of uh, western, Vir into the mountains of western Virginia. So just wanted to let uh, Johnny Quest uh, should be on alert for some heavy rain up where you are. But uh, again, that's just for day one. I'll just put the three-day total here. And you can see they've cut it back again uh, with the heavier rains of an inch and a half or more. Central and western PA, central and western New York. Uh, back through West Virginia, that striped down the Appalachians, and then on the other side uh, in uh, eastern Ohio, uh, down into eastern Kentucky and <clears throat> parts of eastern Tennessee. So uh, at least I think the initial worry was that we were going to have something where the core was going to hold together maybe and, come, and, and, and the thing was going to ride up along or just offshore the coast. So uh, not happening, which is uh, 
at least that avoids some sort of mega rainfall for somebody. Uh, but, uh, you know, still going to get some heavy rains out of this uh, in uh, areas to the west. Yeah, and uh, again, for, for the tri-state area, I'm, I'm thinking, Joe, that uh, especially for areas north and west of the uh, New York, the immediate New York City metropolitan area, we could see amounts, again, taking into account the possibility of a bit of convection, maybe anywhere from one to two inches, and maybe a bit less, uh, maybe half of that, half to one inch from the city on south and east across Long Island. So there will be rain, and there will be um, some significant rainfall, but it won't be anything I don't think that many of us cannot handle. And the good news is, is that it's it's all gonna, it's going to be all but over first thing in the morning on Saturday. And so uh, that'll give time for whatever rain that may have caused localized flooding to drain off uh, during the uh, early part of the day on Saturday. So if you're if you got something planned Saturday afternoon you know, or Saturday evening, if you're going somewhere, I, I highly doubt that the rain is going to be a problem or the leftover rain, because again, a lot of that will be left behind us, and it's going to be a, a wonderfully warm day on Saturday. You would not expect uh, the, the 12th day of November to see temperatures close to or above 70, but that very likely is going to be the case on Saturday. And then the sweep of the first shot of chilly air comes in on Sunday, and then the real cold moves down and in for Monday and Tuesday. I, I got the upper air up on the GFS. It's kind of interesting here. Uh, you uh, you can see all these weather systems that are running around in the upper atmosphere. The first trough comes out. Uh, then uh, the, the, the upper air pattern kind of flattens out a little bit uh, into the uh, middle part of the week. Now, there's a, something that gets kicked out. There's a system, if I'm just going to roll it back, there's an upper low that's coming into Oregon and California on uh, Friday night and Saturday. That drops southward into Arizona and New Mexico, moves across uh, Texas, but... It, it doesn't really hold together very well. It kind of weakens as it moves to the northeast, at least on the GFS it does. Uh, then there's another system that drops down out of the west behind it. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that one, on the uh, GFS anyway, uh, is uh, I just highlighted it there. You've got an upper low sitting in northern Minnesota. So we're kind of getting our air, you know, just kind of uh, coming down out of Canada <clears throat> and moving uh, from west to east. There's a system for, for uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday that approaches and weakens. But the second one on the GFS uh, is a little more dynamic and lifts up to the northeast into Ohio, western Pennsylvania, western New York, and keeps on going. And after that, now this is where it gets a little tricky because there's a ridge off the east coast near Bermuda. We've got another deep trough that drops down uh, into the middle of the country. Okay, It's very broad. But that upper high that's off there is being supported by the fact that the GFS wants to develop another tropical system of some kind in the Caribbean that it eventually takes up into the Bahamas. It's nothing, you know, nothing to write home about. But I go back to what I said earlier, that the development of these tropical systems tends to enhance the ridges that are off the East Coast. So and the model may not be correct on that. That's the thing. I, and, and that's going to impact everything else that's uh, downstream from it. So. Uh, it, you got to be a little careful in how you read uh, what may or may not happen when you're looking at this in the longer term. But for now, uh, you know, as we run through this upper air, and I, I'll go to the North America view so we get a better, you know, wider view of this, so you can see what's going on in Canada. I mean, look at the, look at that big upper high that builds up in the Northwest. I mean, that's that negative East Pacific oscillation signal that uh, we've talked about the last few days, and that uh, continues to be shown very strongly on all the models. You see how the how deep the trough gets in the eastern part of the United States late next week uh, and beyond. And as one pulls out, again, is there going to be another tropical system to enhance the ridge off the Atlantic coast? I don't know. Uh, but uh, it still doesn't seem to want to stop the models from dropping relatively deep troughs into the east I mean, it still looks, and now we're going just past Thanksgiving here. I mean, the models are still holding on rather firmly to this idea, Joe, that the pattern is going to be mostly cold or colder than normal uh, going forward after we get through this weekend. Well, yeah, it, it, you look at some of the uh, long-range uh, forecast uh, models and uh, guidance from Climate Prediction Center, and they're talking about, you know, all over, practically the, the, whole, the entire country 
the entire contiguous United States will be below normal. In some cases, way, way, way below normal. So uh, I, I, I tell everybody true, if, you're, if you really are enjoying uh, and will be enjoying this spell of mild weather for the next 48 hours, is soak it up as much as you can because after Saturday evening or Saturday afternoon and evening, it's going to be a long, long time, I think, before we see temperatures recover, even back to near normal, maybe right on through the end of uh, end of November. So, And that includes, of course, Thanksgiving. So enjoy it now because it's, it's going bye-bye very quickly. All right, so let's just run through the GFS surface here, and you can see Nicole comes in, no mystery here, up the west side of the Appalachians is a non-tropical low uh, that uh, heads up into upstate New York and up into Maine, uh, heads uh, from there across New Brunswick and then to Nova Scotia uh, and and out. Um, might get a little bit on the windy side, especially along the coast to later t- uh, tomorrow night into Saturday morning as the front approaches, maybe even some gusts past 40 miles an hour. That wouldn't shock me. Uh, so up that goes. And uh, then we've got the upper trough that the GFS wants to produce some light snows at eastern Ohio and western PA uh, Saturday evening. Uh, that f- sort of falls apart, uh, generates a little bit of precip uh, Saturday night just offshore. So you get this cold shot and that high, that 1037 high north of Superior. Now here comes the ne- the system out into Texas, and there's a little bit of snow on the northern end of this. But again, the GFS says <clears throat> that this thing is, is pretty weak. It just sort of miners out. But then it's got the second one coming down, and that one it's a bit more serious here. This is at the end of the week where it's got a relatively widespread area of snow uh, in uh, Tennessee, central Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, up through Pennsylvania and upstate New York, actually takes a low uh, just just uh, inland uh, of the coast until it gets out near Atlantic City. It's got a low there, and then it deepens to a 980 low in the Gulf of Maine and moves away to the northeast with some colder air behind it. Yet another one comes out to start off Thanksgiving week, and it actually would, uh, th- that one's coming into colder air on the GFS, so uh, there's a, th- th- it's got some snow there in PA and West Virginia. Again, how real this is, I don't know. And there's that little tropical system I was talking about. If you look here, way down the road, and it's done this for a couple of runs, it's got some kind of tropical low uh, over the Bahamas uh, that uh, it uh, does something, uh, tries to do something with off the southeast coast. Again, I don't know how real that is, and that could be impacting uh, again, what the model's trying to do with with, with the, the the flow from Canada. Uh, the European is different, or at least it was different when I last looked. So let's see. On the new one, it's not going to go out far enough. Uh, but the European is the, certainly the same with regards to Nicole. Actually, the European might even be a shade even further left than, than the GFS is. Uh, and then that goes out. Uh, the upper trough comes by. You would argue that there might. I threw in the chance that there could be a shower Saturday night with the upper trough. I just I threw it in there. I, I think that's worth mentioning. Yeah, I I, I would not disagree with that. And uh, I think uh, whatever we do see in terms of unsettled weather will be in and out very quickly. So you may go to sleep uh, Saturday evening uh, with, with no precip and skies clouding up a bit and then wake up on Sunday morning with those same clouds leaving. And at the same token, uh, they may have dropped a little bit of uh, precipitation your way in the overnight hours. But I think Sunday looks to be basically a dry day, sunny to partly cloudy. But again, just a noticeable decline in temperatures from near 70 on Saturday to the 50s on Sunday. You will know between Saturday and Sunday, something is coming through to replace or there is a transition of sorts taking place in the weather uh, between what we're going to experience on Saturday versus what we'll get on Sunday. And uh, here's the uh, European, by the way, which for early next week, the system on Tuesday, which it doesn't weaken like the way the GFS does. And by the way, <coughs> this does only shows precip precipitation rate. It does not. Sh- this map does not show uh, rain versus snow, and uh, it does have a low uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, just uh, off, just near Norfolk in, in, in the southern part of the uh, of Chesapeake Bay, that it moves out to just southeast of Montauk and then northeast from there. 
and it doesn't have that second system at all. It just make, brings down colder air behind it, and, and, and that's the end of it. So um, the two models uh, uh, differ greatly. And actually, uh, the, the, the differences of, of the uh, show up uh, at 100 uh, at 120 hours. I mean, it's the, the, it, they're totally different with how they handle this first system. And the uh, Canadian, just for laughs, we might as well look at the Canadian, uh, because the Canadian Joe would support the notion the Canadian's the coldest actually of all of them. And hold on, let me put the rain and frozen. Uh, so you could see the Canadian actually would suggest that maybe some inland areas could see a little wet snow with a low going off North Carolina and then uh, and then out to the east. And the Canadian also uh, doesn't have that second system at the end of next week. Uh, it uh, seems like maybe it wants to do something going into the very beginning of uh, the week of, of, of starting Sunday, November 20th. There's some moisture coming out of the Gulf states. So uh, a little bit of confusion by the models, we can say. Uh, for the the, uh, the longer term, uh, but all operating on the idea that it's going to be a, a generally colder than normal pattern. And by the way, I've been say I've saved this so that I could look at it every day. So this was the latest eight to fourteen day outlook. So this would be from November 18th to November 24th, and right. still and still much of the nation is um, at or below normal. Uh, through that uh, entire period, with the uh, the greatest chance for below normal temperatures up around the Great Lakes, the Northern Ohio Valley, and uh, going back up into the Northern Plains, but still a fairly strong chance, 60 to 70 percent, I think that is, uh, in the Northeast, uh, down yeah. uh, into uh, the Ohio, the Lower Ohio and Tennessee Valley, and back over into Texas. If you want it warm, go to the southern half of Florida. If you want it normal, go to the Pacific Northwest. And uh, it, that would be my advice. It's what I, you know, I said a few moments ago. It looks like virtually, not a, not every place, but I mean, virtually much of the contiguous or 48 states are going to be uh, blanketed by below normal temp uh, probability of below normal temperatures for not just six to ten, but eight to 14 days, and that could take us virtually to the very end of the month, and then also enveloping Thanksgiving. So it looks like it's going to be a, it's going to be one of those cold Thanksgivings coming up, or at least chilly Thanksgivings. Any of you having any any you know thoughts about going to the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade? You might want to uh, start considering bundling up because it looks like it's not going to be it's not going to be parade weather. Certainly not uh, the kind of weather we're going to have in terms of temperatures these next couple of days. Uh, two super chat hits tonight. Leon Probitsky hitting super chat tonight, and the thank you, Leon, and the chairman Scott Briller. Uh, says, hi, weather family, a special Briller Jeopardy inspired by Mr. Rayo coming on Monday on most of these Joe and Joe stations. <laughs> now, what did I inspire? The cold, the uh, the change in temperatures? The, uh, well, we'll have to just wait and see. Yes. Um, yes. So there. Uh, okay. So on that note, uh, actually, I, I did see somebody post something that I, that uh, – I should mention uh, about about the overall pattern. I'm sorry, I lost. I can't. I lost it now. I can't see where it is. Uh, but whoever you know brought up the point about the fact that the upper air looks kind of wild. It actually does over the next couple of weeks. There's a lot of short waves running around. And the one thing I did notice, Joe, is that the unlike the last couple of years where the Pacific has been really kind of dead uh, much of the time, uh, almost like a fire hose depending on, you know, your perspective, going from west to east. But there's a lot of weather systems running around in the Pacific this year. There's a lot of storminess out there in all different places. And uh, th that might have implications down the road with these systems in the east. Whenever you have, when you, whenever you have a lot of weather systems running around, it makes the models kind of crazy because each one will key on the one it likes uh, and, and do something with it and maybe – ignore the ones that are behind it uh, or the other way around. So it just can't seem to pick out how to, how to you know, which one's going to be more important. Plus you've got that jet coming in and then you've got the cold Canadian jet involved. Uh, it's one of those deals where, you know, if the North gets with the South at some point, at some point, you might have something, um, you might have something exciting to talk about. So I'll just. Yeah, it, it, in the winter time, it is so much more difficult to try to, pick things out, especially well, you know, more than a few days in advance, because the flow usually is moving so quick. And so 
in one run, you've got maybe one system that's teleconnecting with another system that might be further to the north and blowing it up into a major system. And then six hours or 12 hours later, you've got those same two systems that are left completely and totally independent of one another, not connecting, and they both stay relatively weak. And then it keeps going back and forth. And it's not until they're literally upon you within 72 hours that you finally know the difference or you finally know what, what the story is actually going to be. So that's just another factor of what we're seeing uh, coming up in the uh, days to come with the fast flow. And, uh, and, and you, you said it, it's, it's a, in a way, it's almost like in some cases, a fire hose. Um, it, it's, it's difficult for the models, even though they're supercomputer models, my goodness, even they have problems sometimes in ferreting out timing and whatever storm crack and, and, and whatever strength a storm system may get, depending on whether or not it remains independent of it itself or whether or not it latches onto another system coming on through. It's it's crazy. But at, at the least, Joe, it's not going to be uh, a boring pattern these no. uh, coming days ahead. It's going to no. be and most interesting. And this may be one of those cases where, you know, literally you and I get together, we talk about something, we, we, uh, we discuss uh, a certain uh, potential situation, and then the very next night, Everything changes. Everything changes because uh, the pattern uh, flipped, or you know, something just didn't happen the way we thought it would. But again, it's it's not going to put you to sleep. It's going to be uh, very interesting these next, uh, not just next few days, but next few weeks. I think. Fire truck 1988 says he's not showering until we get a blizzard, which ought to make him very popular in a crowded subway car. <laughs> <laughs> I will just point that out. Um, okay. So uh, on that note, let's uh, let's go to um, let's do Briller Jeopardy, shall we? Who has who has it tonight? Do I have it? You I, have or, it. Cecilia have Hernan- it. Hernandez says, were were any sprites appeared over the outer bands? I don't know what sprites are. You know what sprites are? Uh, they're they're a, a very strange atmospheric phenomenon, and I've seen them photographed actually. On uh, spaceweather.com, they sometimes will will talk about that. And it's uh, 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 and at one time it was thought to be a supernatural entity, uh, but it's it's a it's some kind of a how can I put this like a, an electrical discharge in the atmosphere, not like lightning, I don't think so much, but it's uh, it's 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 sometimes uh, emitted upward from the top of. Uh, of a, of a cumulonimbus cloud during a thunderstorm. And uh, again, sometimes it's photographed, it, it sometimes looks red or orange uh, in photographs, but it's not seen too often. Uh, uh, again, some kind, I'm not, and like you, I'm not really into it in terms of uh, uh, specifically an inter, uh, a definition or whatever, but it is some kind of a, an electrical discharge that okay. occurs in cumulonimbus clouds, sort of thing, something unusual. And now that I've said all of that, no, it's not. It's not, for example, a. a uh, well, it is. It's it. it, it what? It's a. It's a beverage. Got right? <laughs> a refreshing, clean-tasting beverage. I, I chose. I chose to stay away from that. <laughs> all right. So let's see if I can find. You find. I just wanted to, Sanders asked about the weather in Kansas. Actually, looks just colder than normal overall, and just fairly uneventful for the next ten days. I mean, that just that's kind of my my uh, basic generic look. Everything you know, the, these these weather systems coming out in the southern part of the jet stream seem to be passing too far south for you. So, I, I at least that's the way it looks right now, uh, without me, you know, I'm just kind of doing it off the top of my head. I I, I really should, should have to look a lot closer, but just a cursor review, I would say what I said, which is uneventful and just colder than normal. Not too much happening uh, nasty wise in the next uh, week, week to maybe 10 days. So, all right. So I, I found Briller Jeopardy. Okay. I'm looking at my, there's my screen and there's Briller Jeopardy right here. And he says, uh, here's a winter Briller Jeopardy for Mr. Chiaffi in the chat board since 1869, Joe and uh, fellow uh, Joe and Joe fans out there, Central Park has had at least has had at least seven, well, has had seven snowstorms of at least 20 inches. How many years can you name and hint? Two of these 20-plus inch storms occurred 
in the very same year. Okay, well, there was 2016, right? Well, we have 2016. Uh, that would be the uh, storm that we had on January 22nd through the 24th, a weekend storm. And uh, also in the books as the heaviest snowfall ever in New York City history, 27.5 inches. Jason Schaefer says 2010. Steve LaPointe, 2016. Chuck Cardillo says 1969. I don't think the, the, the Lindsay storm was, 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 was on there. Um, I would, okay, so I would add 1996, January of 96 in there. Um, yes. So uh, Christina Pedia says 2013. Uh, Jacqueline Baxter says 2020. I'm trying to remember what, what, what happened in 2020. I, you know, my my memory is so bad. I used to know. I used to remember all of these things. Yeah. Uh, uh, Christina Pedia saying 2010 and 2011, which was a snowy winter. Uh, Mark DeCara 1993 is a no. I know, and, and, and that that's that, that's a definite no. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to. Steve Lapointe says 2003. Uh, are we hitting any uh, any of these? Yeah, uh, so there there are lots of hits, but also a few misses, like what Steve just uh, mentioned. There, at least on uh, Scott's list, there's no 2003 storm. But I will tell you that the uh, the two that occurred in the same year, that particular year, was 2010, but they didn't occur back to back. Uh, the first one in 2010 was February 25th and 26th. 20.9 inches at Central Park. And then in uh, the December 26th and 27th, 2010, 20 inches. Was that the uh, was that the Bloomberg blizzard? That was the Boxing Day storm, right? In 2010? December was, of 2010. The one where the one the one where Bloomberg was in Bermuda or whatever. And, yeah, that's December. The Boxing Day was 20, 2010, December right. of 2010. And then the January one. The January 26th, 27th was my birthday blizzard. Yeah. Well, January, and what year was that? 2011, right? 2011. Believe it or not, he does not he does not have that on the list as the oh, seven man, you know Central what? Park. Well, I'm not sure what, I don't remember what year it was. But the thing is, I've been skewed different. Living on Long Island, I, we had so many 20-inch snowstorms. Like the 2013 snowstorm that I got 30, 30 inches out of is not going to be on that list for New York City, right. for, Central, right. for, for, for Central Park. Exactly. And I can tell you that, you know, I I remember when you got that storm. I was uh, at News 12 in Yonkers. We had a <laughs> a very sizable snowstorm, but everybody was looking at what was happening to Long Island. We had in Yonkers, we had like 12, 13 inches, which in any winter would be a very substantial snowfall, but nobody was talking about Yonkers or nobody was talking about the Hudson Valley because you guys out in Long Island had anywhere from 20 to 35 inches. And that was the storm, I believe, where uh, a good part or a big, good chunk of the Long Island Expressway, cars were abandoned on the roadways. They couldn't get anywhere uh, with that particular storm. So that was, and, and that did not make the uh, list for Central Park, the seven and, that Scott has has given. To and us. by the way, there were a few professional colleagues on that day that I I, I really, well, I was accused of ruler envy. Okay, <laughs> I I was I was one of the first people to report that morning. Okay, so I was I was I was accused of ruler envy, and I simply said, okay, you know what? Why don't you come here and I will stick your head. In the 30, 30 inches that I had, and and it was, and I'm not gonna name, I am, I'm not gonna name them, okay? I am not gonna name them, uh, but uh, yeah, it it was, I I guess once everybody else started coming in and and saying, you know, that there was 30 inches, I don't, I don't play that game. I mean, it was, I stuck my yardstick in the in the ground, and it was at 30, <laughs> and. Right. I don't know what else to tell you, but uh, it um, it was just kind of funny. I just, you know, just popped into my mind now that we're talking about it. 
Well, since now that we've discussed this for a good 10 minutes, let's let's go right down the list quickly here um, with what Scott has provided. So in Central Park, number one on the list, as we mentioned, January 22nd to 24th, 2016, 27.5 inches of snow. The number two on the list, February 11th and 12th, 2006, 26.9 inches of snow. Number three on the list, one that was way back a ways. In fact, this was the storm that for many, many, many years, uh, Joe and I growing up in the Bronx, savoring and salivating, thinking about having a storm like this. December 26th, 27th, 1947. Again, for a long time, this was the topper in Central Park. 26.4 inches of snow. Now that's down to number three. Number four is the Great Blizzard of 1888. March 12th to 14th, 1888, 21 inches. And then we have the, the, the final three storms separated by mere tenths of an inch. February 5th, uh, February, the number five storm, February 25th and 26th, 2010, 20.9 inches. Uh, number six was January 7th and 8th, 1996, the blizzard of 96. At Central Park, they recorded 20.2 inches. And then just two tenths of an inch less than that, exactly on 20 inches, December 26th and 27th, 2010. I call it the Bloomberg blizzard. A lot of people call it the Boxing Day blizzard. Whatever you want to call it, that marks the bottom of the list of the top seven with an exactly 20 inches. And I forgot who mentioned the Lindsay snowstorm. I have a feeling. Cardillo. Chuck Cardillo. I have a feeling that the Lindsay snowstorm might very well have made it into this list. The only problem is that we've mentioned on many occasions back in the 1960s, uh, rather than really strenuously going out and making as accurate a, you know, a measurement as possible of heavy snowfall, what they did was they just go out on the street outside of 30 Rockefeller Center and they'd measured on tops of cars, <laughs> and that basically was what what stood as the as the uh, no matter. Am I correct on that, Joe? That that's how they did it back yeah, then. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not sure about the late '60s. It was certainly in the '70s that that was the case. I mean, yeah. the, the blizzard of '78. Uh, I think for New York City, they they have 12 inches, which I thought it was kind of convenient that they put 12 inches and they were forecasting a foot, so they got the 12. But there's no way it was just 12. Okay. No. There's just no, no. way it was just 12. I uh, can personally tell you that at my house in Throg's Neck at the corner of Huntington and Lafayette Avenue that we had 22.0 inches of snow with that. No, yeah. a far cry from 12 inches. <laughs> yeah, that was ridiculous. I don't know what, uh, you know, that had to be a, that had to be a car top measurement that they did. Yeah. And on that note, I think we can wrap the show up for tonight. So, um, I'm thinking now that probably won't be a Joe and Joe weather show tomorrow because it looks like, you know, a, Unless it starts to look as if we're going to get clobbered with severe weather, I may sneak on. But you've got things to do, so uh, I may sneak on if it looks if it looks like it might get a little rough tomorrow night. Otherwise, we will see you back Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So mark that down, and we'll see you then. Thanks for the chairman and from uh, Leon Probitsky. Excuse me. I had nachos for dinner, so they're kind of oh. kind of coming back on me. Uh, for the uh, super chat hits tonight, thanks uh, again to Chairman and to Leon Probitsky, uh for for hitting the tip jar. And uh, Joe and I will see everybody back on Sunday. Nighty night, everybody. Bye, folks. <laughs>